Okay. So are you going to do a countdown now? Welcome everyone. I'm so excited that you're here. I want to make sure that you can see us and hear us. So definitely click in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from. If you're on Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube, we're on all the platforms. We can see you coming in right now. So if you have questions for Joanne or myself, uh, please feel free to add them to the comments and we will get to them as best we can. For now, I am going to go ahead and get started because I can see everybody logging in right now. And awesome, awesome. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much. We have Chris from Ottawa who's here. Hey, Ottawa. Yes, Ontario in the house. <laughs> That's right. All right. Let's see. Who else is here? Marsha. She's on Facebook Live. Emily Joy is from Seattle. She can see us on Facebook Live. Hello, Seattle. Deborah is in Sugar Grove, Illinois. Yvonne, she's on Facebook Live. Wanda, oh, people are going off the screen. There's so many. Beamsville, Ontario. <laughs> That's great. Right. Yes, this is amazing. So amazing. I can see everybody. Yes, I love it. Give us some hearts. We want to see the hearts. Yes. Okay. And I'm going to acknowledge everybody as much as I can here. Crystal from Surrey, BC. Sai, Celine from Toronto. Celine Hello, Celine. I'm in Toronto too. All right. Jocelyn from Comox, BC. I probably said that wrong. Okay. Comox, right on. Come Welcome. On. Okay. Jake from Boston. Elizabeth from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Okay, we're, we're definitely international here. Raquel from Brazil. That's Hello. amazing. All right, Mimi from Massachusetts. Paul. Oh, Micmac, yes, represent. Thank you awesome. so much, Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia, awesome. I love this. Okay, I'm gonna try to go faster so that I can get You know, Molly, what I really like about this is yeah. as much as COVID's been so difficult for a lot of us, it's also brought us together in some incredible ways. And so just to see people streaming in from different parts of the world just really excites me. It's so wonderful, yes. Shindale from Los Angeles, Brian from Chapel Hill, Natasha from Ontario, Brittany from Chicago, Sarah from Cincinnati, Christopher, Annabelle from Idaho, Joey from Alberta. We've got hey, Joey. From Seattle, Damon who's from Philadelphia, Jonathan from Weaverville. Ruth is from Rochester Hills, Michigan. Christopher's from Los Angeles. We've got Kern County, California. Hi, Pawan. Hi, Lori from SC. Verona. Okay. Hi, Marsha from Verona, Wisconsin. E. Brandy from Tacoma, Washington. La, La Sharon from Riverside, California. Oh, and it just goes on. Okay. I'm going to skip over here because I see. Mayang is from China. In oh, wow. Canada. Amazing. Right. All Hello, right. China. Awesome. Awesome. We got more Ontario, Minnesota. Hi, Susan. Hi, Jessica. Sherry from Corvallis, um, Oregon. From Seattle, Washington. We've got Tori, Lisa from Salt Lake City. They're all we streaming in. Page, Phoenix, St. Louis, um, Seattle, Las Vegas. Hello, everyone. Okay. Awesome. Got the Bronx, Patrick's from the Bronx. Awesome, awesome. Leticia from Bowie, Maryland. All right, so we've got, oh, Brandy B from Arlington, Virginia. That's where I'm originally from. Oh, here we go. Charlotte's from Kenya. Hello, Charlotte. I know Charlotte. <laughs> Thank you. From Indianapolis, we've got Hawaii in the house. Um, awesome, awesome. 
international, national. We've got a lot of folks still chiming in. While we're doing that, I want to introduce our guest speaker today. And let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and like that. Thank you so much, everyone. Yes, and we are still chiming in. Feel free to keep typing in where you're chiming in from, where you're watching from. If you're on Facebook Live or YouTube Live or on LinkedIn, we want to see you, hear from you. And feel free to type your questions in the comments. Like I said, we're gonna get to them as best we can. We're so excited to have you here. I wanna introduce my amazing guest speaker. And Joanne and I had a great talk this morning. We just said, hey, we're human beings. We're doing this amazing topic on creating an anti-racist organization. We're not the be all end all of this topic, right? So totally. you know, we've, got, we've got so much information, so much excitement around this. We love it. We are doing this work intentionally and um, we're gonna give you some great gems that you can take away from this, um, but it's not the end. So I just wanted you to know that. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Molly Oyua. My business is Sacred Fire Creative. We're a digital marketing agency. We specialize in working with women and minorities. And we're based out of McMinnville, Oregon. So I love that we've got representatives from everywhere and we've got so much going on for this training today. Joanne Kenya Baker is originally from Kenya and immigrated to Canada several years ago after a satisfying career working with the refugee population across several refugee camps in Africa for a few years with the UN and the United States Resettlement Program. For over 17 years, Joanne has continued to advocate for the voices of equity seeking groups that are marginalized in society in her different leadership roles. Joanne is the founder of Shades of Humanity Consulting, where she and her team work with organizations to develop effective anti-racism and EDI strategies. She is also a licensed social worker and adjunct professor and a diversity and inclusion strategist with a municipal government. Joanne's passion and teaching areas include anti-racism, emotional intelligence, unconscious bias, and refugee forced migration and trauma. Joanne is the vice chair for the advisory to Corrections Canada, uh, Ca Corrections Canada's Calgary Parole Board and the Calgary Police Services Diversity Board for the African Communities Roundtable. Joanne and her husband, Jason, love to travel and barbecue even in 40 degree weather there minus are, 40. Minus, oh, minus 40 degree weather. There are Canadians, right? Uh, there are many things that I love, but her top four things are travel. Ooh, this is a new one. Gummy bears. Have to hear about that one day. Music <laughs> and a good book. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Joanne, to get started. Everybody's really excited to have you here. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm super excited to be here. I just noticed that there's like a rainbow across my, my screen. Can you see that? the camera is like hitting the light in a certain way. And so, so this is how I get to celebrate Pride Month. So happy Pride, everybody. It's so great to be here. Um, Malia, I just, I'm super excited to be a part of this conversation. Like you said, there are so many ways we could continue to have this conversation. So this is just one way that we're offering today. In an hour, we obviously won't have enough information for you to go and say, I just did this anti-racism training, but I'm hoping that you're going to walk away with some tools that will be food for thought, for one, and that you'll also bring back to your organizations and that you can start to unpack some of those things. So I will start. Uh, yeah. So before I start, I actually just wanted to acknowledge a couple of things here. So as I mentioned, I am in Canada, Treaty 13, Toronto right now. And um, this is Indigenous History Month in Canada. It is also Pride Month uh, in North America and across the world. And uh, we recently heard some really heartbreaking news out of Kamloops, BC, where they found the remains of 215 young children our nation is grieving 
And right now, I can't even say enough how much pain there is going on in Canada right now. And we stand with all our Indigenous family right now and just letting you know that we're going to do our part to reconcile. And I will use this platform, too, to call upon the Canadian government, call upon religious institutions to do their part to do their part in reconciliation of Indigenous peoples, to do their part in teaching the correct history that was not taught in schools here in Canada. And so this being Indigenous awareness and us talking about anti-racism, I think it's really important for us to be able to continue to highlight some of the inequities that are faced by our Indigenous um, families out here, as well as try and provide opportunities for equity. We also most recently heard about what happened in London, Ontario, just a couple of hours um, far away, away from where I am right now. And um, a family of four's lives were taken away by a terrorist. And so, and I say that because we need to give language to some of these things. And so to all the Muslim family out there as well, we stand with you during these really hard times that we're facing here. And so we will continue to do this over and over again until voices are heard, until we are united. This is all about love. Um, it is Pride Month, so happy Pride, everyone. But even in the same breath, it's also important to acknowledge that um, the lives of Black and Indigenous and racialized trans and queer people are still at risk in many parts of the world. And so we also want to acknowledge that struggle as well. So if we could just have a moment to consider all the things that are going on around us in the world before we go on with this presentation. So I'll just give us a couple of seconds here for a moment of silence. Thank you. Okay, so this conversation, Molly, is going to be a little bit uncomfortable. And um, Robin D'Angelo says that the key to moving forward is what we do with our discomfort. We can use it as a door out, blame the messenger and disregard the message, or we can use it as a door in by asking, why does this unsettle me? What would it mean for me if this were true? So as we go into this conversation, we're going to bring up a couple of um, topics here that may not be comfortable. I invite you right now to sit into that um, space and understand that we are here to make the world better. We're not here to blame. We're not here to shame. This is coming from a place of love and understanding. And we absolutely invite everybody to unpack some of these things that are happening right now in the world. This, I'm hoping, will also be a space where people can share their ideas and suggestions. But above all, we're really praying and hoping <laughs> that we can have a very peaceful discussion and we will not tolerate um, any ideas that are bigoted or hateful. And um, I think there's a way we could probably remove some of those comments if they do show up. So I thought I needed to share this. All right. So... Let's get into discomfort. But before we do, I want to uh, unpack some of the terms that we'll be using in this discussion. So we're going to talk about racial equity, and I'm also going to talk about racial justice before we even start talking about anti-racism. Now, racial equity is a mindset and a method for solving problems that have been endured for generations, problems that seem intractable, problems that harm people and communities of color most acutely, and ultimately affect people of all races. This will ensure that we are seeing things differently, thinking differently, and doing the work differently. Racial equity is about results that make a difference and last. And I'll say that again. Racial equity is about results that make a difference and results that last. Now, racial justice is the systematic fair treatment of people of all races, resulting in equitable opportunities and outcomes for all. Racial justice and racial equity goes beyond anti-racism. I'll say that again. Racial justice and racial equity goes beyond anti-racism. And this is why, because it's not just about the absence of discrimination, Molly. It's also about the presence of deliberate systems and supports to achieve and sustain racial equity through proactive and preventative measures. 
so those are some of the terms um, that we'll be using in this discussion. Okay, there's a quote here that I really love. And it says, the real challenge for organizations is not figuring out what we can do, but rather, are we willing to do it? We could have an entire long shopping list of the things that we can do, but without the willingness to do it, then we're really just shopping, right? Robert Livingstone, Dr. Robert Livingstone from Harvard University came up with this really brilliant five steps that I'm going to talk about throughout this presentation on how we can start to achieve racial equity within our organizations. I'm going to refer to this presentation as reimagining racial equity versus creating an anti-racist organization. Creating an anti-racist organization is an amazing goal. It seems quite large and quite far-fetched. But before we get there, how about we reimagine what that would look like in our spaces? And so the first thing is, are we willing to do it? And I'm going to leave that to all of you as a question. So Dr. Livingstone talked about going through this process through five steps. He came up with this article last year, and he and I connected about it. And he's also written an amazing book called The Conversations. And I encourage everybody to read that book. It has very practical very current um, ideas of how to infuse racial equity in the spaces that we navigate every day. And um, when he talked about the roadmap for equity, there's five steps laid out in this particular roadmap. Again, just like diets and just like exercise, there's a ton of ways to get the results that you want for your body. Some of them are effective. Some of them are not necessarily effective. What we're offering you today is just one way one way to incite and inspire some curiosity within you so that you can be able to bring information to your organizations and see how you can start to create change. There's several ways, several trainings, and so please know that this is just one way that I found to be beautifully effective in, work, in the work that we do. So we use the acronym PRESS for this, okay? So it's problem awareness, root cause analysis, empathy, strategy, and sacrifice. We're going to spend a little bit of time on the first two, which is problem awareness and root cause analysis. And in problem awareness, or PR, um, we're asking ourselves about the conditions. So right now, I'm inviting you all to start just doing a bit of a reflection on the condition of the workplaces that you're in right now. Do you understand the problem of race, racism, racial inequity within your organization? And do you also understand where it comes from? So once we spend time on the P and the R, all the other pieces start to actually come together. The next part I will talk about is concern. So yes, I understand what the problem is, but do I care enough? Do I care enough about the problem and the people that it harms? The people that it harms in this instance are the Black and Indigenous people of color, also known as BIPOC, and I'll also refer to that as Black, Indigenous, and racialized. Do we care enough about how they're navigating the world in our workplaces? And the strategy is the next step. This is about correction. So we found out about the condition. We, we've invested some concern in it, and now we need to correct the problem. Do I know how to correct the problem, and am I willing to do it, right? Maya Angelou says that when we know better, we do better. Are we ready to actually do better in our organizations in a way that's not performative, but rather in a way that is meaningful and a way that is intentional? And so we'll get a little bit into this by starting with the first thing on problem awareness. So problem awareness asks, do I understand the problem? And I welcome the folks who are out there watching this live stream to take pictures of these slides. You have absolute permission to take pictures of these slides. And we will be sending all this information after this um, webinar for, for folks to actually unpack and like use up if they need to. So we're looking at the problems in our organizations. Do I understand what's going on? right in my organization right now is the first question that I would ask here. And there's ways of how we can do this. Now, this particular um, principle here was created by Community Wise out in Calgary. Shout out to all my people in Calgary. That is home for me. I miss you all. And Community Wise in Calgary, through the leadership of Felicity Lettner um, and a couple of other folks out of AROC, which is the anti-racist organization change group, 
came up with a way of figuring out this particular, did somebody say the slides are blurry? I'm hoping that everybody else can see yeah. them clearly. <laughs> sorry, there's a lot going by, so I didn't mean to click on that. Um, sorry, Daniel, that the slides are blurry for you. It's probably also a fact of the live stream. So probably. for those of you who are on, it looks like the YouTube live stream, it might be a little bit blurrier. I did request for the 720 pixels for the Facebook live stream. Um, and you do not okay. be logged in to Facebook in order to view it. So I had a lot of questions about that. Um, there were also a lot of questions about the slides and are we sharing this afterwards, Joanne? Are we sharing yes. this? Yes. We I'll make this available to everybody this after. Available, so don't yes. worry. And we'll also have the recording afterwards. Um, but yes, I'm getting a lot of, it looks good. Slides look good. Thank you so much. Okay, excellent. I'm happy to hear that. Um, and it's good to hear that it's clear on Facebook, right on. Okay, so right now I'm just inviting folks in to understand where they're at right now in their organizations. Um, when Sky Lewis designed this particular image, um, it was really around conversations of us being able to evaluate where we're at in the organization. So we have some organizations that are fear motivated and are active. And these particular organizations, um, we call them performative because they are out there putting statements and doing things, they're active in doing all of it, but it's not clear that the values of racial equity are actually being infused in the organizations themselves. And then we have the organizations that are fear motivated and inactive and hence are petrified. And these petrified organizations are probably afraid of being called out because they don't treat their staff in a very racially equitable way. Um, and they probably just don't know what to do or say, so they go silent about it, which is different from the performative because performative is, for instance, you find um, there's a couple of organizations that put up these black squares during uh, after the murder of George Floyd and in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. But that's as far as they went. Black square only, nothing deeper, nothing to support your staff. And then you have the organizations that did absolutely nothing, went silent. It's like nothing really happened. There's no inquiry into how the racialized staff are navigating the workspaces. Those are petrified organizations. And we have the perpetuating organizations who are values motivated, but they're inactive. And the reason for that is because they probably are um, a human services agency that has serving people as their mandate and feel like that's enough because they're doing good work and don't necessarily have to dive in to those particular values of racial justice for their staff within their organization because they're doing good work and they have a great representation out there, re reputation out there. And then we have the values motivated organizations who are also known as principled organizations. So they're values motivated and they're active. They are doing what they can to ensure that their leadership is racially equitable and reflective of the people they serve and people in the organization and people in their communities. They are okay with letting people go for being racist they are also okay with understanding that they can do better and find opportunities to do better, not in a performative way, but in a way that actually affects meaningful change within their organizations. So if folks are actually uh, looking at this slide right now, it would be great to know where you think you're at in your organization. I'll caution to that. There's uh, moments when you can have all, all four of these in one organization, you could have, you could be principal in one department and completely petrified in another department, right? So it's not to say that um, there's a perfect standard here. There is no perfect standard here, but really we are all striving towards being a principled organization. We're striving towards being principled employers. So um, I'm hoping that I will send along this particular tool that also has all the descriptions and how to do this work. And I think you would really enjoy it. I'm happy to see all the things that are coming through about being principal, perpetrating, petrified. Again, I approach the subject with absolute gentleness and love and knowing again that when we know better, we do better. So let's work towards becoming better at this. All right, um, thank you so much. 
So now we're still in the P, which is problem awareness. And when looking at this, I'm sorry, this picture does look quite small, but when we look at the organization, we wanna look at the organization as an onion with multiple layers in this onion. And when we look at the different layers of the onion, we're asking ourselves, how do our racialized employees navigate these layers of the onion? So for instance, um, in your human resources, right? How does that work in your organization? How do people of color, how do racialized people navigate dealing with HR in your organizations? Let's talk about hiring. So when it comes to hiring, how do we, how do we navigate the idea of ensuring that we're hiring leaders who are who are racialized and representative of our communities, whether it's the queer community, whether it's the uh, diverse ethnocultural communities, what are we doing to ensure that we are eliminating bias in some of these things? Um, when it comes to external communications, and I know Molly, this is your area, right? As a as a as a person who represents um, people of color, racialized minorities as well uh, in your organization, I'm sure you're dealing with folks that have probably had situations where there wasn't any racial equity where they were, and they come to you who specializes in that work. How amazing would it be if we had a Mali in every organization that is able to work in communications with people of different backgrounds? That would be so incredible. And so I offer this tool for folks to just go back and look and see, okay, you know what? Our cultural norms and unwritten rules may actually be super detrimental and dangerous to the people that we serve. What can we do about it? And so for a second layer of how to navigate this, you will take each layer. Again, this was done by Sky Lewis and developed by Community Wise Resource Center in Alberta, is um, take each layer and ask these three questions, right? So we talked about hiring. Hiring is one of the layers in your organization. The first question you wanna ask is, what have we done? So for instance, you've probably put out a statement of non-discrimination. Um, you've put uh, job descriptions, calls out in public so that there could be more people who have access to these resources. And you've hired a racially diverse hiring committee so so that you've eliminated bias in that way that's awesome so then what's working is you have an objective hiring criteria and another practice that we're seeing that seems to be working really well is equivalence experience is accepted okay so instead of saying you must have 10 years experience you have to have this degree let's look at a combination of what makes sense for this job the reason why we say this is because a lot of people who don't have access to some of the education and experience, but are still incredible workers, miss out on incredible opportunities because of all these high standards that have been set. Whereas we could actually train people for this work. And then you could ask yourself, what do we need to change? So should we implement bias reduction strategies, blind resumes, I see that comment there, um, give interview questions in advance. You know, I don't really think there is any value in, in surprising people at interviews, just because a person interviews well does not mean that they're a good worker. Think about it. Why don't you set people up for success and send them questions in advance? Um, list your pay on posting. This is really important for racial equity. When you list your pay on posting, on your postings, you're actually putting a message out there that there isn't a specific group of people who are going to be paid better than others. And this happens quite a lot. There's so much research out there about how um, racialized folks will get a certain percentage lower than white individuals who apply for, who are working in the same organizations with the same job titles, arguably with even less experience in education. So this is one way of thinking about how to navigate the onion in your organization. And you can do this on all the different le levels there. So that was problem awareness. So we're aware of the problem. Now let's go to the root cause of this, okay? So root cause analysis asks this one question, where does the problem come from? A lot of times, um, and the one thing that we've seen very commonly in the data is the presence of white supremacy culture in our organizations and understanding 
what that looks like in our organizations. For a lot of people, white supremacy culture, as you may have thought or heard, is you know the KKK or um, outright and overt hatred. That's the outside expression of white supremacy culture. However, white supremacy culture exists so it's so ingrained in our organizations that we are not aware that we are actually super complicit in it. And we have a video before I dive into um, specifically the details about this root cause analysis. Molly, if you could share that two minute video for us and we'll be right back to unpack the rest. All right, and so I also, I'm gonna put a question here in the comments for everyone to think about and answer while I'm going to get that. So right here, let's see. <laughs> There's a lot of there's a lot of comments. It's like a moving target here. Right on. And questions and comments are great. <laughs> there's a lot going on. Okay, let's see. Let's see if I can share. And as you're sharing the video, I really want people to start reflecting on areas where they've where they, where they've seen this happen in their organizations and how they could start to change things after this conversation. Okay, so allowing me to share my screen so we might see a bit of, oh, there we go, okay. Are you able to see this? I'm gonna, I'm gonna press play. I'll also include, include the link when I get back um, so you can have that and watch that. Right on. Um, actually, before we continue with the presentation, Molly, can you tell me a little bit about how this shows up for you and maybe what some of the comments are so far, if any? Yeah, so let's let's see. Let's go over to this question. And how does white supremacy culture show up in our organization? So let's go to the comments. There have been so many great comments. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, let's see. We also, some of the comments go back to our previous question. So I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of dive in right here. Alyssa says, I love the posting of the salary in advance. I used to work in an organization where my, white men made a lot more in the same job as others that made much less. Um, so Leah says it shows up in microaggressions. Mm -hmm. 
Right on. Okay, Rebecca says, only using white sounding names or pictures in problem solving examples. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. All right, and let's see. From please educate all children equally, a division of Davis and Frederick LLC, white supremacy culture is at the forefront of the founding of America. And it's really all about normalizing the culture of whiteness, right? This is not an attack on white people. I think people need to see that. Yes, Band-Aids, that's, that's another one. Absolutely yep. right. It's normalized, right? Whiteness is normalized. Um, Emily has a great point here. I learned recently that unless the job description itself is written to remove potential intrinsic bias, that even resume blinding may not be enough, which yes. is the thing I'm going to explore the next time we have a position to post, as well as where it's posted. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Emily. Yes. And so as the comments keep coming in, we can continue with the root cause analysis. And um, my next slide, can you can you put it up? Yes. There we go. Right on. Information flowing through top leaders who are often white males. Absolutely. That is a characteristic of white supremacy culture right there. And so now we're starting to see that it's not really about a, a group of radical individuals or even one race in particular. It's about all of us and the cultural norms that we've accepted. And these norms affect all of us. White supremacy culture is the ideology that white people and the ideas, thoughts, and beliefs and actions of white people are superior to people of color's ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions. White supremacy expresses itself interpersonally as well as structurally. So this is through our governments, through our education. What stories are we, are we being told? In Canada, for the longest time, um, and still till today, it's not fully implemented the true indigenous history of this country. And so this is just an example of how white supremacy culture has been normalized in our everyday um, dealings. Okay, so this is what it looks like. We've seen in the video, perfectionism and worship of the written word, concentration of power. Somebody said that information usually flows through the white males in the organization. Um, the right to comfort, the right to comfort just basically means that people can select when they can be uncomfortable with things because of this normalization of white supremacy culture. Um, there is individualism. There is one way of doing things. Um, progress is bigger or more. Think about how much value human beings bring to the workplace. Your value is as much as the numbers that you're bringing in, the dollars that you're bringing in. And the more progress you have, the bigger and the better it is. And sometimes this also fails to address the issues that BIPOC fo folks are facing in the workplace. So we'll dive a little bit deeper into the right to comfort and fear of open conflict. And this is what it actually looks like. So the right to comfort is feeling entitled to name what is and isn't racism. People of color will tell you constantly that they have to keep proving their, that what they're experiencing is race-based to folks because of that idea of that I need to be comfortable with this information. Um, the valuing of logic over emotion, where people feel that they need enough proof to actually prove that what has happened to me was based on my personal experience of being racially um, secluded in conversations, in leadership, being looked over for um, promotions, scapegoating those who cause discomfort. This is a really big one as well. Um, our next slide here talks about how it shows up in terms of people in power are scared of expressed conflict and they try to ignore it or they run away from it. They say we have a policy where we don't talk politics in the workplace, so they won't say things like Black Lives Matter because it's uncomfortable. There's also an emphasis on being polite and equating the raising of difficult issues as being impolite and rude. Um, and I feel like I must also kind of interject and, and talk a little bit about how Canada is a very polite, very, very polite, culturally polite country. And so in Canada, there is a bit of an optic here that, you know, race and race, race issues are an American problem. 
You won't believe how often I hear that. And it happens right here. And there's just this idea that, you know, racism has to be this really ugly disease that's so overt that it ha we can't be racist in Canada. We, we absolutely can't. We're so nice. That is not true. Um, now that we know how white supremacy shows up and how it's also masked in niceness, it's actually quite harmful and quite dangerous. And this is how we end up in a situation where a family of four is killed and everybody's really surprised. You know, 215 bodies are found and it's like, oh my gosh, this is still happening. The right to comfort, right? When someone raises an issue, the response is to interrogate the person over the problem. There have been situations that people of color who I'm working with as a consultant in an organization will come and say that every time they bring something up, they are questioned, right? So that also puts you in a really vulnerable space when you're being questioned for something that you're actually going through versus even understanding what exactly the problem was. But there's antidotes to this, right? There's, there's, there's ways we could overcome this because this whole idea was how are we gonna create a space um, where folks can actually thrive and racial equity starts to exist in our organizations. The first thing is understand that discomfort is at the root of all growth and learning, okay? The second thing is welcome discomfort and learn to sit with it before responding or acting. And I feel like leaders sometimes feel like they need to jump into a response, um, whereas that's not very effective. If you just sit there with the discomfort, know that as a person of color, I know that you're taking me seriously by being intentional about your actions when I come to report something. Distinguish between being polite and raising hard issues. I think that's really, really important. And I found too that it's you, you, you're welcome to invite a neutral or a third party to support how we can explore some of these issues in the workplace, particularly if there is harm being caused within the organization. I wanna talk about policy for a second here. When you have a workplace anti-bullying policy, that doesn't necessarily cover um, the anti-racism piece that we're hoping to achieve within an organization. Bullying sometimes looks very different from racial discrimination. And so we can't really take that, we, it's like taking Tylenol for diarrhea, right? It probably will work, but you probably want to take the right medication for that, right? And so the invitation here is to deepen your political analysis of racism and oppression so that you have a strong understanding of how your personal experiences and feelings fit into a bigger picture. At the end of it, we're working towards racial equity. So the next thing here is around empathy. So we've talked about the root cause analysis. We've talked about how white supremacy culture shows up. We've talked about identifying some of these issues here. And now we need to move to a place of empathy. Empathy asks, do I care enough about the people and the problem that it harms? Empathy and sympathy are different, right? Um, Non-racialized individuals who witness racism experience sympathy. So when the whole thing happened with George Floyd, rest his beautiful soul in peace, um, there was just a lot of tears and pain happening, which is a very natural reaction um, when you experience something like that. The people of color want empathy and solidarity. I want you to stand with me. I want you to hold my hand. I want you to go ahead and work on policies work on reform, work on change, racial trauma, folks, it is exhausting. We need allies now more than ever. We need accomplices. We need people who are willing to actually stand in the gap because you have the energy to do so and move and fight for change within our organizations, right? Don't leave this work to the people of color in the organizations to organize and to form and to formulate different strategies of how they could be a more racially equitable organization. 
this work is for everyone, folks. This work is for the racialized individuals. It is for the white folks. It is for people with power. It's for those who are trying to find a voice in their organizations. Let's work with an empathy approach to ensuring that we're moving the needle towards meaningful change in our organizations. If your employees don't believe that racism exists in the company, diversity initiatives will be perceived as a problem and not the solution. If a racist incident is going to be treated with uh, diversity and inclusion training, we've absolutely missed the mark because we have not done a problem and we've not done an analysis of the problems. We've not looked at what is the root cause of all of this and we've jumped right to a training. It is like putting a Band-Aid on a heart surgery scar. So then we've talked about empathy, moving towards empathy, and now we need to talk about strategy. And strategy asks this question, what are we going to do about all the information that we've had? It's going to be uncomfortable. We need to do something. We've come this far. We want to make changes in our, in our workplace. And it's going to be a very interesting journey for the folks that actually get this far to embarking on the strategy. And um, Dr. Livingstone offers that there should be three things that leaders need to consider as working through strategy and changes need to happen, interventions need to happen through these three fonts, fronts sim simultaneously. So we need to work on personal attitudes, um, informal and cultural, informal cultural norms within the organization, right? Like who do we go out to lunch with? Who do we go golfing with? Like how, how are some of these things that we do in the workplace um, infusing inequity in our workspaces, right? Formal institutions and policies, I can't stress enough how, how important this particular part is. Without these institutional policies being changed, we can do every single thing that we can, but we're not going to go far with our racial equity um, goals. Now, Here's another one. There is no test or interview that can invariably identify the best candidate, right? Instead, hire good people and invest in their potential. I've heard so many times the excuse around why uh, racially diverse candidates were not picked because the organization was going for the best candidate. I don't know what you're saying about other people if they're not qualifying to be a best candidate. Remember, it is a test. How many times do you end up firing people in the organization because they weren't great workers? They actually got there because they interviewed. But it's really not a show of how hardworking or how amazing someone's going to be in the workplace. So this is a it's a, an invitation to actually think differently about your hiring practices specifically, because that's where the problem starts. The people who you bring into your organization is where the issues actually start. So we need to sacrifice a couple of things here, right? And so fairness requires treating people equitably, which may mean that we're going to treat people differently, but in a way that makes sense. I'm going to say that again. We might need to treat people differently, but in a way that makes sense. Only because if we're looking for the participation of all people, we cannot apply the same approach. We cannot use a one-size-fits-all to everybody in an organization. Different treatment is not the same as special treatment. The latter, special treatment, is tied to favoritism and not equity. Okay? And here's another example. We've probably all seen this image, right? Equality means everybody gets a bicycle, right? Like we've achieved our equality by everybody getting a bicycle. But equity, equity means that everybody gets the specific vehicle that they need to get them to where they need to go in an equitable way and in, in a way that makes sense. So as you can see here, we treated everybody differently, but the outcome is actually going to be so much better because it's meaningful. And so when we have employee resource groups within our organizations, when we have um, black support groups within organizations, it just means that we're allowing people a space where they can thrive and where they can create ideas and feel accepted, um, which would be very different from, for instance, saying having an, a white employees group, right? 
providing equity in that organization means that we may be treating people in a different way that fits that fits the goal of where we need to be as an organization that is racially just. Yes, that is a I love that image too. I think it it speaks more directly to the idea of equality versus equity than the there's a graphic that we've used previously in the past with the crates and the fence. Um, but I feel like that also didn't speak to the idea that we have different physical abilities. And so this new offering here, um, I believe really does speak well to it. And then Audrey Lord said that you do not have to be me in order for us to fight alongside each other. I do not have to be you to recognize that our wars are the same. What we must do is commit ourselves to the same future that can include each other and work toward that future with particular strengths of our individual identities. In order for us to do this, we must allow each other our differences at the same time as we recognize our sameness. We are more similar than we are different. And I think once we start to use that as a baseline, Molly, we are able to actually start to move this whole idea of racial equity together. This work is for all of us, right? For us to not to ensure that the black and indigenous and racialized people in our organizations are not suffering from the burnout, everybody needs to take a piece of this pizza and just work on it. I have a couple of references here that I've used for this presentation. White Supremacy Culture and Organizations is a tool developed by Coco out in Montreal, built up from the work for from dismantling racism out of the US. Um, and then there's also a couple of other tools here that I haven't included here, but I will include them um, for anybody who would like to get further information. My contact information is over there info at shadesofhumanity.ca. I'm happy to connect with folks who want to take this conversation to the next level. I encourage you all to really read authors of color who have done this work. Um, I also encourage you to take a deeper look at Dr. Livingstone's Five Steps, um, the press that we've just discussed, to see how you could bring this into your organization. For the folks that are in Canada, um, Community Wise out of Alberta also has some really great resources on anti-racist organizational change. And I really just welcome you to have a look at some of the tools that they have. They're free and available to everyone on their website. And I'm also happy to connect with anyone who would want to take this conversation to the next level within their organization. So it's been great. Um, thank you so much. I would love to hear what folks in the comments are saying. If there's questions, we have a couple of minutes that we could unpack a bit of that. This has been amazing. Thank you so much, Joanne. So let's see here. We have just so many great comments here. I know that people have so much gratitude for you. So thank you for this wisdom, great program, great information. Let's see. This was a wonderful session, impactful presentation. Love to all. Thank you, phenomenal presentation. Here we go. We have a question for you. It kind of flew by, so let's see if I can find it again. Do you consult at departments, at universities, or only businesses? Um, that's a question for you, Joanne. So let's see, Kayla, you can reach Joanne at info at shadesofhumanity.ca. That's one way to reach her or at her website. So you can reach out directly. And thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Amaya. All right. Thank you. And yes, to answer that question, anyone who would like to reach out to please um, feel free to connect with me and I could see what some of your needs are and I would also be happy to share some more resources. So yeah. wonderful. And then some of you said, um, let's see, some Liza Ann was interrupted a million times listening on her hospital cafeteria culture. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. And yeah, it is on, it's live stream, so it's on uh, Facebook and YouTube. 
uh, and LinkedIn. So it's available for you. You can you can take a look at this again. And um, I will repeat her email address, but it's also posted right here. Info at shadesofhumanity.ca. And I did post mine up for a while, but again, so many comments have gone by, which is so great that <laughs> I don't know where it was. That's good. I'm, I'm happy to see that there was so much interaction. And I'm also happy to connect with folks on LinkedIn too. So yeah. uh, just Joanne Kenya Baker, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn and I would be happy to connect over there. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, oh, great. So Marsha's saying she's going to invite the entire board to watch. That's, That's awesome. Thank you, Marsha. <laughs> and then I also wanted to share, um, thank you so much, Joanne, and for sharing that information. I want to share, um, let's see if I can share my screen. Okay. And so that I can share some other great events that we have coming up. So um, this is our Eventbrite page. Um, again, I put this link in Facebook, in LinkedIn, and I will add it to YouTube. So creating an anti-racist organization. This was today's. Um, and then we also have next week, communicating through an equity lens with Tracy Lamb of Partners in Diversity. How to be anti-racist actions speak louder than words. Uh, Reimagining Support During a Mental Health Crisis with Vic Well on July 12th. How to Navigate Racial Trauma at Work. Anti-Racist Education, How Do We Get Things to Stick with Ellen Mutu. How to Create Your Own Ally Pledge, Become an Ally for Love Above Hate. Uh, that's with Joe Meyer. Uh, Becoming Anti-Racist Starts with Self-Examination on August 16th. How do you identify the intersection of inclusion and identity on August 23rd with Rachel Hicks? Anti-racism in action, how to call out racial discrimination at work, and that's all the way into September. So obviously we have a lot of different things going on coming up. We encourage you to continue the conversations and please do reach out. Oh, I love that, thank you. LA for love. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share and open it up. If you do have any more quick questions, we have time for maybe one. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I wanted to say to big shout out to all the amazing uh, work that you have coming up. Those are so meaningful. And I look forward to coming to all of these if possible. And I also really encourage folks to come in and just build up on this, right? Like one hour is never enough. We always need to keep learning and becoming better at what we do and changing the spaces that we, we navigate every day. Awesome, awesome. Nicole says she's looking forward to joining more. This was her first time. Um, Jean says, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Lynn says, interested in future events. Selena, uh, we don't want to leave either. You know, I, <laughs> I don't want to leave people. either. <laughs> people always ask me, Molly, please, can we come? Can we just stay for another hour? And I, you know what I have to say is that, hey, I do this every week. Everybody, I've been doing this for for years, but also every week. So just know that this this is not the end. And um, oh, people wanted me to share my email again. So if you uh, wanted to reach out, uh, maybe you're in this space and you're a speaker as well, you can reach out to me. We're scheduling into 2022. Um, so I'm gonna put my uh, contact information in the chat. I know that somebody just asked me for that. So it's Molly, my first name, M-A-L-E-E. -E at sacredfirecreative.com. And then this this question is for you, Joanne, which is, it's a very big question, but let's give maybe like one one tip while we're here. How do you move organizations from, from petrified into the other categories? Oh, wow. That is a great question. It's super loaded. Um, we would definitely need to unpack this uh, at a different forum. However, um, Adriana, I would I would urge to that once we look at the organization through the onion that I shared earlier on, we're really able to identify places that we could start to change. And you know what? It starts with the leaders, right? If we don't have buy-in from leadership, 
then you can rest assured that you will continue to remain in that petrified space. And so what I usually do is I first want to engage with leaders, engage with leaders to understand why there's so many benefits to becoming a racially equitable organization. And when it comes to them being on board, like the buy-in is there, everything else starts to, to fall into place. But really just taking a look at those different layers of the organization and seeing how you could start to make things better in those spaces. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for the questions. We can never get enough of this. So please, again, if you we're wondering how you can get the slides. Go ahead and email me if you have not signed up on our Eventbrite event. Thank you so much, Joanne. I'm going to end the broadcast now. Hang out with Joanne for just a little bit longer. And to thank you all for being here it's so much. Thank you so much. It means so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was really nice to get to know people through the comments.